now in week one and uh, you know recap them and react to them so for every single matchup in this week one slate we're going to go over the game flow how the scoring panned out after that we're going to look at the key performers in this game from each side and then talk about some of the you know more fine details like penalties uh, turnovers things like that and my general takeaways from the game so without further ado I will present to you our Thursday night football matchup between the Baltimore Ravens and the Kansas City Chiefs. After a long wait, football had finally returned, uh, but not without a 20 minute delay to start off the game. So we waited for that delay to pass. And with that, we returned to the NFL. So this game, we saw the Ravens score the first touchdown of the season off of a Derrick Henry uh, 7 yard, 5 yard run. And then putting the Ravens up 7-0. After that, we see the Chiefs respond with a touchdown of their own off of their new rookie wideout, Xavier Worthy. Uh, he took the ball on a jet sweep and kind of just ran away with it. And, you know, very fast guy with his 4.21 speed. So with that, we had the game tied 7-7 heading into the second quarter. Then we saw two Harrison Butker field goals, giving the Chiefs a 13-7 advantage. And with the final seconds of the first half, Justin Tucker was able to knock in a field goal of his own after already having missed one in this first half. Uh, kind of rare, but in Justin Tucker's last seven attempts from 50 yards out, he's only one of seven, so maybe not as rare as it used to be. Anywho, uh, with the game at a score of 13-10 with advantage to the Chiefs heading into halftime. We saw the Chiefs open up the third quarter with another touchdown off of an Isaiah Pacheco touchdown run, giving them a 20-10 lead. From then, Baltimore was playing catch-up through all of the third quarter, and to start the fourth, they were able to finally respond with a 49-yard uh, touchdown pass from Lamar Jackson to Isaiah Likely. Now, this was honestly not many yards through the air. Isaiah likely caught it and took it over 30 yards after the catch, hitting uh, a nasty juke on the Chiefs defender to s slow up and have him completely pass him and then waltz into the end zone. So with that, the game was uh, very competitive once again at 17-20. But not too long after, we see the rookie wide receiver, Xavier Worthy, score another touchdown for this Chiefs offense uh, on a completely blown play by, I want to say it was Marcus Williams. I don't know exactly whose fault it was, but there was no coverage in the backfield. Wide open touchdown for Xavier Worthy, giving him in two touchdowns on his debut. And then finally, uh, a few minutes later, we saw the Ravens take a field goal from Justin Tucker, 32-yarder, to bring the score to 20 to 27, and as it stands, that was the end of the game. Uh, we have the Kansas City Chiefs taking it home in week one, 27 to 20. There is a lot to talk about with the ending, but I will get to that in just a moment. So, now that you have heard the play-by-play, -play, let's go over some of the key contributors in this matchup. Let me just remember how I access that screen. Okay, here you go. So, in terms of the Baltimore Ravens, your leading passer was Lamar Jackson. He went 26 of 41, throwing for 273 yards and a touchdown. Uh, worth noting that the 41 passing attempts is one of the most, I think we only had one game last year where Lamar threw the ball that many times. So, uh, yeah, the Ravens were down a lot in this game, or for a majority of the game. That does play a big part in that. And then, as far as rushing later, you would think that Derrick Henry, the new addition to the Ravens' backfield, would probably lead the charts in that. But no, it was also Lamar Jackson himself, kind of a one-man show from him in this game. Uh, he took the ball 16 times and was able to get 122 yards of it off of that. So, very effective in the running game, but having to do a lot himself in this matchup. And then finally, in the receiving game, uh, it wasn't Mark Andrews, it wasn't Zay Flowers, it was Isaiah Likely stealing the show for the Ravens uh, wideouts, calling in nine passes for 111 yards and one Dodger down. On the Chiefs' end of things, we had Patrick Mahomes leading the way in the passing game with 20 of 28 passing for 291 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. And I must say, that interception.
perception was not was not a awkward catch or anything like that. No, he basically threw it directly to the Raven split. Uh, and then in the rushing game, the Chiefs did not do as well with Isaiah Pacheco leading the board for them. It was 15 carries for only 45 yards. Extremely inefficient, but he did manage to snag a touchdown with that. And then finally, in the receiving game, we had second year wideout Rishi Rice leading the way for the Chiefs. Uh, lots of slants all over the field, racking up seven catches for 103 yards. So, with that, let us take a look at some of the team stats from this game. We have, in terms of total yardage, Baltimore actually leading the Chiefs 452 to 353, so almost by 100 yards of offense in this matchup. Both teams suffered one turnover in this game. And the Ravens led time of possession 33.43 to 26.17. Now, what went wrong? Uh, one thing that comes to mind definitely if you're watching this game was the number of pre snap penalties for the Ravens. It was quite ridiculous. I don't know how many times I've seen an illegal formation and an off. Not offsides, but. Uh, what's it called? False start in the same game. Uh, but for some reason, they just could not avoid getting those calls on them. Uh, yeah, here we have it. I mean, sloppy game from the Chiefs as well. Uh, the Ravens suffered seven penalties and lost 64 yards off of it. The Chiefs were penalized six times for 45 yards, so a difference of about 20 yards right there. I will say that the officiating at the beginning, it did seem a little bit in favor of the Chiefs. But by the time that the game was over, I will say it was very balanced. Uh, there were a couple times that Patrick Mahomes was out of bounds and the Ravens were able to get a hit off on him. Uh, one of the times it was just because the, Ra the Chiefs themselves had already committed a penalty earlier in the play, so it didn't count for anything. There was no roughing the passer or unnecessary roughness. And another time, Rokon Smith, uh, he was able to pass it off as Patrick Mahomes flopping, uh, and the re refs did not call it, but... Really speaking, Moms was out of bounds. Um, it is what it is. Anyhow, in terms of total offensive breakdown for the passing game, we had the Ravens with 26, 267 passing yards to 281 of the Chiefs. Uh, rushing, it was clearly in favor of the Ravens. The Ravens racking up 185 yards on the ground to the 72 of the in the city chiefs, so over 100 more. Then, in terms of red zone trips, neither team was that effective. We had the Ravens going 1 of 4 in the red zone to the 1 of 3 of the Kansas City Chiefs, and that is kind of demonstrated by the score being only a 7 1 game. Uh, and then, for the turnovers, Lamar lost a fumble rather early in the game for the Ravens, and as I mentioned before, there was a uh, Big thrown by Patrick Mahomes for the Chiefs. Now, this game, even though it was a seven point game, it was this close to going into overtime. And the reason for that is the Ravens, with about a minute and a half, two minutes left, got the ball back from the Chiefs. And they let the ball all the way down the field, uh, behind Lamar Jackson, all those guys. Mostly, I say, likely, I will say, he came up clutch on that drive, catching everything that was coming towards him. Uh, they took it all the way down the field, and with like 10, 15 yards to go, the Ravens were playing against the clock. They had to get all of their chances out of the way before they ran out of time. And so, here on a critical first down, not exactly first down and goal, but you have to take your end zone shot. Lamar Jackson goes for Isaiah Likely in the back left post, um, back left corner of the end zone, overthrows him, just like throws it too high, out of reach for Isaiah Likely, even though he has an amazing vertical, tries his best to leap up and catch the ball, cannot do it. And so, uh, the Ravens obviously want to have that one back, but they do have more chances. So on second down, uh, Lamar immediately faces pressure off of Chris Jones, who has been, you know, really making the game rough for them. And he terribly misthrows on a wide open safe 
Flowers in the middle of the end zone. Zay Flowers is running to his right. Lamar uh, is kind of scrambling to his right, tries to throw it across his body. Uh, he's not set at all, and he just misses Zay Flowers completely. You can see Zay Flowers, like, grimacing. Uh, he's smiling, but really is grimacing. And obviously another throw that they're going to want to have back. And very few seconds left in the game. Third down. This is basically the Ravens' last shot. They run a play. Lamar Jackson lobs the ball into the end zone for Isaiah Likely. He climbs the ladder, catches it, and comes down with both feet inbounds. And the Ravens look to have scored the touchdown to make it 26-27. And Joan Arbaugh is calling for a two-point conversion, meaning that the Ravens would just go for it, go for the win right then and there. Don't give Patrick Mahomes a chance to even see the football again. No overtime, which I think is frankly a good idea. You're on the road. You've been trailing the whole game. Everyone's going to be tired. Just if you're going to try and win, do it here. You don't want to let him get another chance. But upon further review, the referees pull up the close cam of Isaiah Likely's toes and... It is shown that he is actually one centimeter out of bounds. The tip of his cleat on his left foot happens to land in the white zone of the end zone rather than like the white out of the bounce line. And so uh, with that time has expired, the Ravens get no more opportunities. The game is over and the Kansas City Chiefs have won a uh, truly a fantastic way to kick off the season, you know, all the excitement that you would hope for down to the wire to the very last moment. You did not know uh, which way it was going to go, and it was stellar. Now, uh, as far as both teams, what I think about them, I will say the Ravens looked pretty shabby on offense. Um, I don't know if we should be crediting more so the Chiefs' defense or taking away from the Ravens' offensive line. Their own line did not look good. Uh, they were not able to really create any running lanes for Derrick Henry. He was involved heavily early in their first couple drives and then basically phased out of the game completely uh, with Lamar scrambling 16 times on his own to Derrick Henry's 13 touches. And uh, Lamar was just, there was too much for him to do. Um, honestly, the like game was on his back too much. Um, the wideouts could not get open other than Zay Flowers and Isaac Likely. Mark Andrews was completely shut down in this game, something that was rather disappointing knowing that he is fully healthy and back from uh, an injury last season. I was hoping for a better game from him, but we did not see that. And as for the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, I think that their offense looked pretty good as it is. Travis Kelsey didn't really get it going. I mean, he bailed out Patrick Mahomes on a uh, great catch and throw from the duo. Uh, Mahomes was scrambling to his right. Travis Kelsey managed to get open and get the first down. Um, Xavier Worthy, extremely productive, only off of three touches. Three touches, two touchdowns. Absolutely crazy. Uh, and then Rasheed Rice looked great. So the Chiefs offense, all in all, they weren't able to run the ball all that well, but it didn't matter because their air raid offense is back. They can easily throw it all over the field. And this is without the addition of Hollywood Brown. So, uh, you know, kind of dangerous. If you are playing the Chiefs, they look every bit as good as they always have. The Ravens, easy ways for them to get better. Limit the turnover. Um, limit the penalties. First and foremost, they lost so many yards to penalties, uh, and a lot of them were on the offensive side of the ball. Defensively, I will say that they held up a lot better than I was expecting. Um, a little bit too aggressive at times. Um, but for the most part, I thought that their defense did very nicely considering new defensive coordinator. They lost a lot of key pieces. Pretty much if they're competing with 25 other teams in the league, this would have been good enough. Um, but yeah, uh, not too bad. And yeah, that's about it for this first game. After that, let's move into game two. This is our first ever Friday, opening Friday matchup uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and this was between the Green Bay Packers and the Philadelphia Eagles. So in this game, we had uh, oh, we had a lot of sloppiness from the Philadelphia Eagles. 
Eagles take the ball. Immediately turn it over. Uh, the first two Eagles possessions consisted of a interception from Jalen Hurts and then a fumble from Jalen Hurts. So, shaky start. Um, and unfortunately, the Green Bay Packers weren't able to capitalize to the full extent. They walked away with two field goals off of those opportunities. So, ending in the second quarter, the Packers lead 6 0. Then we see new addition to the Eagles backfield, Saquon Barkley, make his mark on the game, uh, scoring his first touchdown from 18 yards out uh, from a pass from Jalen Hurts, uh, giving the Eagles a 7-6 lead. Lots of back and forth in the second quarter. After that, we have Jaden Reed completing a 33-yard run, uh, and the Packers failing on the two-point conversion, meaning that the Packers go up 12-7. Then the Eagles respond with yet again another Saquon Barkley touchdown, this time an 11-yard run from him, giving the Eagles a 14-12 lead. Then Jaden Reed, 70-yard touchdown pass from Jordan Love, uh, most of it coming after the catch. Just did a phenomenal job um, breaking free and running it all the way into the end zone. So, a big Jaden Reed and Saquon Barkley day on these two teams. Pretty much just them going band for band in the second quarter. Uh, so with that, the Green Bay Packers are up 19 to 14. And then we see a Jake Elliott 38 yard field goal as time expires in the first half to put the Eagles down to um, with the Packers leading 19 to 17. Then to start off the third quarter, the Eagles very quickly strike uh, with a 67 yard AJ Brown touchdown from Jalen Hurts. There's another one where AJ Brown caught the ball and just sprinted across the field and into the end zone. So Philly leads 24 to 19. Then we have a two yard pass from Jordan Love to Christian Watson, uh, giving the backers a 26 24 lead. And this makes up for all the other failed. Um, Attempts between Jordan Love and Christian Watson he had two very easy touchdown grabs earlier in the game that he botched, and so he kind of makes up for it here. Uh, and then we get the hat trick from Saquon Barkley, scoring his third touchdown in his Eagles debut off a two yard run, giving the Eagles a 31 26 lead heading into the final period of the game. And then with 7.52 in the fourth quarter, we have the Packers cutting it down another three points, uh, scoring a 26-yard field goal, uh, making the score 29-31. And then the Eagles are kind of in control at this point. They're just milking the clock. They are not able to score, but they take the clock as far down as they can, and then they score another field goal, giving them a six-point advantage with 27 seconds left. Uh, so they're up. Sorry. 34 29, not a six point advantage, a five point advantage. At this point, it's up to Green Bay to kind of hope for a miracle. Oh, you're going to need a Hail Mary, something like that. We have them go onto the field, try their best, and unfortunately, the worst you can imagine occurs. We have Jordan Love trying his best to extend a play, uh, and then as he's trying to get rid of the ball to Josh Jacobs, he kind of gets sandwiched. His legs are. Um, getting ripped out from underneath him, and we see his knee pop. So immediately he goes to the ground, and he is writhing in pain, uh, and he has to be taken out of the game. With Malik Willis substituting in for him in like the final two plays, 10 seconds left. Um, horrible, horrible news for the Packers fans. Luckily, as the next couple days uh, passed, we have learned that it is not a season ending injury. Thankfully, uh, he'll only be out three to four weeks. It is in MCL's brain, I believe. And so that is very reassuring. The season is still hopeful. Um, you know, at least you didn't lose your franchise quarterback for the entire season, which is great. Um, but yeah, obviously a very scary injury and horrible way to end the first game of the season for them. So that is the full breakdown. Now let us go over some of the team stats. In this game, we had Jordan Love going 17 for 34, uh, throwing for 260 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception for the Green Bay Packers. Then, rushing the ball, we have Josh Jacobs not too efficient in his debut. Oh, actually, I guess he picked up uh, not too bad by the end of it. 16 carries for 80 yards, 84 yards, so averaging a nifty 5.25. Yeah, that's, that's decent. And then, receiving the ball. We've got Jaden Reed with four catches for 138 yards and a touchdown. And don't forget his rushing touchdown. He was doing it all for these Packers. Then on the Eagles side, we have Jalen Hurts going 20 for 34 uh, for 278 yards and 
in the end zone. Uh, horrible pick. So, his decision making, honestly, the Red Cup Lamar dropped interceptions. Jalen Hurts in this game threw a lot of risky passes. I feel like his, his reads and his decision making does need a lot of work because it was not its best in this game. Um, the Packers easily could have had like four interceptions, but uh, they dropped a couple. Then Saquon Barkley, magnificent in his first game for the Eagles, starting off with 24 carries for 109 yards and two touchdowns on the floor, uh, with much more in the receiving game as well. And then the leading receiver for the Eagles was A.J. Brown with five catches for 119 yards and one touchdown, so picking up at his stellar pace that he left off in midseason last year. In terms of offensive production, it was almost dead even between the two teams, with the Packers amassing 414 yards of offense to the Eagles 410. Now, in the turnover category, the Packers actually won this battle, surrendering one turnover to the three of the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, time of possession was in slight favor to the Eagles with 32 minutes and 47 seconds to the 27 and 13 of the Packers. Now, uh, in terms of sacks, both teams allowed two sacks, so pretty even. Um, in terms of rushing the ball, both were very effective, with the Packers gaining 163, uh, 163 yards on the ground to the 144 of the Eagles. Um, the difference really was in red zone efficiency and in penalties. Um, pretty sloppy game from both parties, with the Eagles getting 7 penalties for 57 yards, but the Packers outdoing even that with 10 penalties for 71 yards, uh, which is absolutely unacceptable. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of red zone efficiency, the Eagles were able to make it down there six times and walk away with a touchdown on three of those trips. 50% not too bad. Uh, the Packers, on the other hand, only able to make it four times and walk away with a touchdown once. So, had to settle for a lot of field goals, and that really is why they lost this game, uh, in my opinion. And then, yeah, uh, as far as takeaways, honestly, it was a solid game from the Packers. There were easy marks where when they brought it down the field, they just couldn't capitalize. If they had, they could have easily won. Um, now with the game being over, you really just have to hope that Jordan Love can recover as quickly as possible, and then you pick back up. But uh, I was very impressed that Packers balled out for most of the game, and it was very entertaining on the Eagles side of things. Even though they won, I feel like they, they can play a lot better. Um, some horrible, horrible decisions from Jalen Hurts. A lot of very risky throws, um, poorly made passes, ball security was an issue. Um, and even with all of that, they put up 34 points and all that. So Jalen Hurts, rough first day, and even so, a rough first day for him was 278 with two touchdowns. So just clean up your act and you can easily dominate. Um, you don't have to be winning by five points, you can be winning by a lot more. Anyhow, then let us head into the Sunday slate. Let's talk about the game of the week. Uh, you know, everyone's game that they were looking forward to in this week. The primetime matchup between the New England Patriots and the Cincinnati Bengals. Now, this looked to be an absolute, um, you know, mow down by a Super Bowl contender against one of the worst teams in the league. So, clearly, that is what happened, right? wrong. <laughs> no, not at all. We have in this game the New England Patriots starting off, well, I mean nothing happened in the first quarter. Scoreless in the first quarter, nothing at all. Then in the second quarter, as the opening moments kick off, we have the New England Patriots getting a 7-0 to zero lead over the Cincinnati Bengals, which is pretty big. Uh, the Patriots defense absolutely shut down the Bengals offense on their first two offensive possessions, forcing two three and outs. Then on the third offensive possession for the Bengals, they start getting it going. Uh, you know, things are clicking. Jamar Chase is in, in this game. Higgins is out. Um, and so they marched the ball all the way down the field, and they threw a touchdown pass to Mike Gusecki. Um, and so it looks like the game might be all tied up. But upon further review, Mike Gusecki did not survive contact with the ground. Uh, ball came loose.
was definitely hit the ground, and so the touchdown is called back. So, no problem. They run up another play on a second down. I believe uh, Joe Burrow passes the ball to Tanner Hudson. Tanner Hudson evades a couple of tackles, makes a diving leap for the end zone, and Kyle Tucker smashes the ball out from his hands, uh, causing it to perfectly bounce off the turf and into the hands of Marcus Jones, who was able to recover the fumble and drive it 20 yards up the field. So, the New England Patriots at the one-yard line, preventing the Bengals from scoring. Uh, absolutely brilliant. And so, with that, the Patriots uh, take the ball, go down the field, score a 32-yard field goal with the time expiring in the first half, uh, taking a 10-0 lead over the Cincinnati Bengals. Then, in the third quarter, we have the Patriots. Um, I think they had a 3-and-out. Uh, I believe that's what happened. They could not do too much. Bengals' defense stood up uh, pretty well. And so, they are forced to punt. And then, after punting, the Bengals muff the punt, allowing the Patriots to take over deep in Bengals' territory. Uh, and unfortunately, they were not quite able to punch it in there either. But uh, they got another 35-yard field goal off the legs of Joey Sly, giving them a 13-0 lead. Now, uh, the Bengals obviously need to figure something out because they are in deep, deep stuff. Um, and here's when they finally are able to string together a solid set of plays, charge the ball down the field off a lot of good Zach Moss runs and some precision passing from Joe Burrow. The Bengals are finally able to respond with a five-yard touchdown run from Zach Moss, making the game 13-7 in favor of the Patriots. Then, to kick off the fourth, the Patriots get the ball. Um, they eventually are able to go... Yeah, they're eventually able to go out and get another field goal, um, making it 16-7, a two-possession lead for them. The Bengals get the ball back, and they... I honestly don't remember that drive all that well. Let me see if I can find it. Six plays, 37 yards. Yeah. So we have... Yeah, uh, the Bengals very quickly are able to get the ball kind of into um, New England territory off of a 28-yard pass from Jamar Chase. So it looks like they're about to catch up in this game. Um, but then after that, we have an incomplete pass to Andre uh, Chivas. I think that's how you say it. Then on 2nd and 10, Joe Burrow scrambles for 5 yards, making it 3rd and 5, and then on 3rd and 5, Keon White gets a sack on Joe Burrow, preventing the touchdown, preventing anything else from happening on this drive. So on 4th and 7, they go for a 51-yard field goal, and Evan McPherson knocks it through the uprights, making this a 16-10 lead for the Patriots. The Patriots at this point, um, they get the ball, and they really don't do anything with it. Um, they get one first down off of a good Ramondre Stevenson run, but then they uh, quickly lose the next three plays, and so they're forced to punt. So, with three minutes left in the game, the Cincinnati Bengals have the ball with a chance to go down the field and potentially win the game, and the Patriots' defense forces another three and out. Uh, we have incomplete pass, incomplete pass, and then a short pass to Zach Moss, and he has stopped five yards short of the line. The, the Bengals only held the ball for 51 seconds, and then they were forced to punt it. So the Patriots get the ball with two minutes and 13 seconds left, and they close out the game uh, off of good running. They eventually are able to hit victory formation, run out the clock, and the Patriots take game one uh, of the NFL season, 16-10 over the Cincinnati Bengals on the road. What a game. I could not believe what I was watching every time they got a turnover. I was like, wow, they really did that. Uh, there was even one more turnover very close uh, to the end zone. I think it was Joe Burrow like, maybe like scrambled up and he was getting close to the end. Um, and then ball got knocked loose. It looked like the Patriots 
Patriots had recovered the fumble, but actually his knees were down, so it was fine. But what a game. So let's take a look at the team stats in this one. We've got Jacoby Brissett for the Patriots going 15 of 24 out of the pocket with 121 passing yards. Then rushing the ball, uh, Ramondre Stevenson with a very productive game, 25 carries for 120 yards and one touchdown. Then in the receiving game, Austin Hooper leading the Patriots receivers with two catches for 31 yards. And then on the other side, you have Joe Burrow with 21 of 29 passing for 164 yards. Um, Zach Moss rushing nine times for 44 yards and one touchdown. Then Jamar Chase catching the ball six times for 62 yards. In terms of team stats, the Patriots led in the offensive categories, believe it or not, with 290 total yards of offense to 224 of the Bengals. The Bengals lost in the turnover department 2-0. to zero. Uh, Time of possession was also controlled by the Patriots 34-03 to 25-57. Uh, we had, in terms of Passing. The Bengals were actually in the lead in that department, but not by too much. Uh, the Patriots only allowed one sack in this game for a total of one yard, whereas the Bengals allowed Joe Burrow to get sacked three times. Uh, in terms of rushing the ball, Patriots with a clear cut advantage, getting 170 yards on the ground to the 70 of the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, then in red zone attempts, neither team was too pretty. The Patriots going one of four when the red zone trips but getting a lot of field goals out of it, and the Bengals going one of two, so they couldn't even get to that red zone. And then the Patriots were the more penalized team in this game, suffering five penalties for a total of 40 yards, whereas the Bengals only had two penalties for 10 yards. Um, but in the end, the Patriots walk away with the victory, way in victory uh, with their new rookie head coach, Gerard Mayo. He got a big Gatorade pass from the players as they won in the final seconds. And man, oh man, was this a spectacle to watch. You know, I have I've been blown away by some games, but like to be the team that we were last year, come out and absolutely eliminate that Bengals offense was amazing. Like, it's not even that the Bengals were were killing themselves. We were forcing those turnovers. We, as if I'm on the team, the Patriots, the Patriots defense was knocking the ball loose left, right, and center. They were tackling so well, uh, poking the ball out, getting their hands on all sorts of passes. It was it was something to see. Uh, and then on the offensive side of the ball, they just played well enough. Uh, if I'm being quite honest, Ramondre Stevenson, the blockers, they all did a great job. Jacoby Brissett with his ability to scramble out of the pocket, I think that does add a layer to this New England offense that they didn't have last year. Now, Brissett as a passer, it wasn't great. There are a lot of very off-target throws and throws that ordinarily you want your quarterback to be able to make, but he played well enough to stay in this game, uh, and yeah, they, they got it done. Jacoby Brissett getting a victory in his Patriots reunion. Gerard Mayo first victory. Then Joe Burrow, uh, yeah, 164 yards. Like, he didn't look that bad, per se. It was just... They they had made it so hard. The pressure was good. <laughs> the, the tackling, the, the forced turnovers. Um, Christian Gonzalez did a mighty fine job on eliminating whoever he was covering. Jamar Chase only six catches for 62 yards. Uh, in my opinion, no way in heck do you pay that guy. How can you want 34, 35 million dollars? You can't even be one of the worst teams in the league. And you showed up. You showed up. If they had lost this game and he didn't show up, he could have used that as leverage to be like, yeah, man, you guys lost to that team because I wasn't there. Instead, Jamar Chase is there, T. Higgins is not there, and they lose. I, if I'm the Bengals, I am seriously going to be like, bro, <laughs> what is this? What is this? Um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna live on this high for a little bit. I don't know when we're gonna have this again. The Patriots 1-0 and starting off with a victory on the road. I don't know how long we'll have a positive record for, but man, am I going to ride this high. Bengals, things are not going to get easier if they play the Chiefs next week. And man, oh man, like, Patriots defense is legit. For, for sure, legit. They look good on special teams. They look good on defense. Those are so solid. The Patriots offense.
uh, but Ramondre Stevenson in the offensive line did a great job. I would just say that Bruce said I'm in favor of him playing for now, so I'm okay with it. I do want to give as much time to Drake May on the bench so he can learn as possible, but yeah, what's separating New England from being like a truly good team is their offense still. And then, as for the Bengals, you, you did fine. I mean, your your defense limited us to one of four on red zone trips, only ended up surrendering 16 points, considering you also lost the ball twice. Your defense held up pretty well. It was the offense. The offense was horrible. Uh, but yeah, let us, you know, I digress. Let's move forward into the next couple of games. Uh, the next few games, I will have less thoughts and takeaways just because uh, these games thus far, I was able to watch the Chiefs, the Eagles, the pa Patriots, and then in the later period, I caught parts of the Commanders game and the Broncos game, and then I was able to watch all of the Lions and Rams, but for those games that I did not get a chance to see, um, I'll be able to keep it a little more brief. Alright, let's move into the next game on the Sunday morning slate. This was a matchup between the Arizona Cardinals and the Buffalo Bills. In this one, Arizona got out to a hot start, taking an early lead of 10 to nothing over Buffalo, and then quickly expanding that to 17 to 3, uh, with 2 minutes and 40 seconds left in the first half. Uh, Buffalo was able to sneak in a touchdown with it. 19 seconds left off a Josh Allen run, making it only a 7 point game, adding into halftime. Then in the third quarter, Buffalo uh, made their full comeback, tying the game up 17 17, and then eventually taking the lead at 17 24. Uh, then in the fourth quarter, we saw a field goal from the Cardinals, making it 20 24. Then another touchdown off a Josh Allen run, giving the Buffalo Bills a 31 20 lead. So after being down by 14 points early in this game, they are now leading by 11. The Cardinals are luckily able to respond with a touchdown of their own on a 96-yard kickoff return. This is the first touchdown using the new dynamic kickoff rules. Uh, and they were also able to score a two-point conversion, so that makes the game 28-31. to The Bills score a field goal with just under two minutes left, and then the Cardinals take the ball. And they honestly could have won this game. They had the ball, they took it down the field off of a lot of short chunk plays from uh, Dre McBride in the middle and then Greg Dorch on the sidelines and that was really working for them. And then they had a, a third down, it was like third and ten, and instead of running a chunk play or anything that made sense, oh, with like seconds left in the game, they ran the ball, uh, and it was incredibly dumb, I think it's like, it was all horrible, horrible play call in my opinion, uh, they got two yards maybe, put them in a fourth and eight, and now they can't even go for an end zone shot, they have to just pick up the first down, time is running out, um, pressure on Kyler Murray, he floods it to, uh, the left sideline, for Greg Dorch and honestly puts the ball on the money, but the defense is just really good. Greg Dorch is only able to get one hand on it and pass falls incomplete. With that, the Buffalo Bills win the game. Uh, very good game, you know. I only got the last like minute and a half, but I was following the score and, um, you know, great rally from Buffalo to come back and win that one. In this game, we had Kyler Murray going 21 of 31 for 162 and one touchdown. Uh, he also was the leading rusher with five carries for 57 yards. And then Greg Dorch led all receivers with six catches for 47 yards. For the Bills, we had Josh Allen going 18 of 23 for 232 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, James Cook was the leading rusher with 19 carries for 71 yards. And then we had Keon Coleman calling in four passes for 51 yards. In terms of total offense, Buffalo led by just over 80 yards, getting 352 total yards to Arizona's 271. Both teams turned the ball over once, and they were almost dead even in time of possession with the Cardinals holding the ball for two, 29 minutes and 30 seconds to Buffalo's 30 minutes and 30 seconds. In this game, uh, we've got 
Arizona Cardinals, allowing four sacks on Kyler Murray to the two on Josh Allen. Uh, running the ball, it was almost the same. We had 124 rushing yards from the Cardinals, 130 from the Buffalo Bills. Uh, a lot of that thanks to the quarterbacks, you know, being able to pick up the ball and run with it. Uh, and here, the difference lies in the red zone, you know, grips. We had the Buffalo Bills reaching the red zone six times, which is pretty good, and then walking away with a touchdown on four of those attempts, uh, whereas the Cardinals went 2 of 4, which isn't too bad on its own, but um, they just couldn't get to the end zone as often. Then in the penalty game, the Cardinals were penalized five times for 31 yards, choosing nine penalties for Buffalo and 65 yards there. And then in terms of fumbles, both teams lost a fumble. And even though the Arizona Cardinals were not able to muster up as much offense, once again they had a over 90 yard kickoff return touchdown, so their special teams helping them stay in this one uh, with the new dynamic kickoff rules. Um, a couple things that we learned, Arizona, obviously their offense is hugely elevated with Kyler Murray being back. They got off to a hot start, but then I... Kyler Murray in the passing game was like completely neutralized. I want to say like he sat at 140 for the longest time. Heading into halftime, he had almost like he did land over 100 yards. And then the second half of the game, he just was not able to connect with his receivers. It seems like a uh, very bad debut for Marvin Harrison Jr. I think he finished with a one catch for four yards. Uh, not what you wanted to see out of your premier wide receiver. Oh, honestly, the passing game wasn't the best for the Cardinals, even though it was a very impressive game from them, and they did almost win it. Um, a lot of points they could improve on in offense, mostly in the passing game. And then uh, for the Buffalo Bills, it was weird early on. Like, Allen wasn't playing poorly. They just found themselves in deep bowl. And then, uh, yeah, he ends up going complete super eight out, winning this game for them. Uh, passes for two touchdowns, rushes for two touchdowns. Um, really shared the wealth on this offense. I want to count. Let's see. Yeah, Josh Allen completed a pass to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different uh, players on that Bills offense. So really all around. I mean, the Cardinals also have completed pass to eight different receivers. Um, I think both of these depth charts were kind of interesting to see how they played out with Greg Dorch and Drake McBride taking the cake for the Cardinals. Um, Marvin Harrison Jr. only targeted three times in his debut. Uh, Drake McBride seeing the most targets with nine, only converting five of those into catches, with Greg Dorch not too far behind with eight targets for six catches. And then for the Buffalo Bills, no one saw more than five targets. That was for Keon Coleman. Everyone else saw three or less. So the Buffalo Bills, even though they don't really have a star wideout or anything like that, they managed to get it done. And I guess this is kind of like the Josh Allen formula where your your star quarterback, you give them lousy weapons and they just off of sheer willpower overperform and keep you in the game. So, yeah, uh, Cardinals, very impressive game from them. I think that they do have places where they could easily improve. Um, defense is obviously a big factor that they need to work on uh, offensively. I think they're a big boost from last year, but defensively they surrendered a lot of points there. And then um, after the Bills, try and keep this going. I don't know how long you can keep it going for. You did manage to slip a victory here. Uh, it was very close at the end, and you fell down early. You're not going to be able to claw your way out of all of these games. So, uh, just stick with what you're doing and try and limit the penalties, and you should be okay uh, until further notice. Then, next up, we've got the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Atlanta Falcons facing off. This was a rather snooze-fest of a game. Um, 
having not watched a single moment of it, I am just judging based on no actual expertise. <laughs> so maybe it was fun, maybe it was fun, but the winning team did win without scoring a single touchdown, so I don't know how much fun it could have been, really. Um, we opened the game off with a field goal from the Falcons, then a field goal from the Steelers, then the uh, Falcons throw a pick, then we get another field goal from the Steelers, a punt from the Falcons, and then a punt from the Steelers, and then we get a Falcons touchdown. So heading into the end of the first half, it is a score of 10-9 in favor of the Falcons. Not too crazy anyone's game at that point. Then the Steelers start with the ball in the second half, can't do anything with it, but the Falcons fumble on their first possession, leading to yet another field goal for the Steelers. Another Falcons punt into another field goal for the Steelers. This allows the Steelers to go up 15-10 on the Falcons. The Falcons, three and out, lose five yards, uh, and then the Steelers take over, and they string together a very long drive. 13 plays, 72 yards, eight up seven minutes of clock, and they end up losing the ball on uh, turnover on downs. So all that offense for nothing to show for it. Then another three and out from the Falcons, a three and out from the Steelers. You end up with an interception from the Falcons leading to a field goal for the Steelers. And then finally, um, with three plays left, 30 seconds, the Falcons trying to put something together. DJ Watt gets a game-winning sack, and that is it. So, very rough debut for the Falcons offense um, in this new regime of Kirk Cousins leading the way. We have, uh, let's talk about the Steelers first. Justin Fields taking over for Russell Wilson. Obviously not what I was expecting when I saw this game, uh, but late Russell Wilson was ruled out with a calf injury. Justin Fields stepped in. He goes 17 of 23 for 156 yards passing. Then rushing the ball, we have Najee getting 20 carries for 70 yards. And receiving, we have George Pickens leading the way with 6 catches for 86 yards. Not that bad in the receiving department. The Falcons, on the other hand, Kirk Cousins goes 16 of 26 for 155. One touchdown and two interceptions, which, quite frankly, is horrible. I don't think that is good at all. Um, Bijan got 18 carries for 68 yards, and the leading receiver was a huge surprise, uh, in my opinion. Ray Ray McLeod, the third, four catches for 52 yards. Here we see Pittsburgh led in total offensive yardage with 278 to Atlanta's 226. We saw three turnovers from the Atlanta offense, and then, uh, Time of possession was also pretty heavily in favor of the Steelers. 35 minutes, 36 seconds to 24-24 of the Falcons. Passing the ball, both teams barely got over 130 yards. Uh, we saw two sacks on both quarterbacks. In the rushing department, though, there was about a 50-yard advantage to the Steelers. 137-89 to 89, uh, red zone. The Steelers were worse. Uh, they went 0 of 2 in the red zone to the 1 of 2 of the Falcons, but the Falcons really could not drive the ball down to the field. Um, penalty wise, the Steelers were set back significantly more. 9 penalties for 60 yards. Not great, but the Falcons had 5 penalties for 34 yards of their own. And as I mentioned, 1 fumble lost and 2 interceptions thrown um, by the Falcons. If you're the Falcons, um, maybe you just need to spend more time together on the field because, geez, that was a disaster. Um, on the bright side, it can really only get better from here. That's probably as poor as you can begin. And even then, you only lost by one possession. Uh, you did get completely shut out in the second half, which is kind of worrisome. But, um, yeah, if you just don't turn the ball over. I'm sure that this game is very achievable, uh, winnable. And then more practice throwing to the receivers. Um, I don't know. I did not watch this game, so I don't really know what the issue was, but not what anyone was hoping for, I'm sure. And for the Steelers, they did what 
what I expected. They they played a well-coached game, even with Justin Fields in as quarterback and not scoring a single touchdown, they won. And that was a grit and grind kind of victory I was expecting of them. So, yeah, uh, I hope that Russell Wilson comes back. I think that elevates our offense. You already got a good victory. Your defense was doing a very good job. So if they stay with it and then your offense improves, then you're in for, you know, a good couple of games. Next up, let's talk about the Tennessee Titans and the Chicago Bears. This was a very funny game to score, uh, keep track of the score of, just because um, the Titans got out to a huge lead in this one. Game started off with four punts, two punts by each team, a um, bunch of three and outs, and then the Bears getting eight plays for three yards. <laughs> then we saw a Titans touchdown and a Titans field goal. How do we see a field goal and a touchdown? Oh, a muffed punt. Oh. <laughs> so, muffed kickoff return by the Bears leads to another possession for the Titans. Titans in the first period are able to take a 10 nothing lead, then nothing from the Bears. They run four plays, then have to punt and at the Titans get a long, strong drive uh, into a touchdown, leading 17-0. to Then the Bears get their first points of the day, 17-3, to and then we go into halftime, so the Titans are leading 17-3 to going into halftime. Um, the Bears punt, and then the Titans are about to punt, but it gets blocked and returned for a touchdown, so due to special teams, the Bears are able to score, going, uh, not up, but bringing it 17-10 in favor of the Titans. The Titans then three and out, then the Bears three and out, then the Titans three and out, then the Bears put together an 11-play drive just to get a field goal. Uh, so it's now 17-13 in favor of the Titans. Then the Titans fumble the ball five plays into their next drive, uh, giving the ball back to the Bears, who run four plays, get one yard, and then kick another field goal. Then, <laughs> well, Levis throws a big six, and so we went from 17-16 in favor of the Titans to all of a sudden 17-24 to because the Bears decided to go for a two-point conversion, and they completed uh, from Caleb Williams to DeAndre Swift. So now the Titans are losing, even though the Bears offense has managed to score zero touchdowns uh, to their two. We see a punt from both teams, and then um, the Titans offense throws another interception. So, yeah, uh, honestly, I hope you were not watching this game, because it was just a, a boatload of bad offense. Um, at least, like, the Chicago Bears were not turning the ball over all that often on offense. They just weren't moving it. The Titans, on the other hand, were moving it at times, and at other times they were just straight up handing it to the other team. The Titans end up winning, sorry, uh, the Bears end up winning this game 24-17. to 17. Uh, Here, these are the final stat lines from the quarterbacks. Will Levis went 19 of 32 for 127, of one touchdown and two interceptions just as bad as Kirk Cousins, <laughs> and then Caleb Williams in his debut, not very impressive at all, uh, went 14 of 29 for 93 yards, so at this rate, he is not breaking any of those Chicago Bears rookie season records, then rushing the ball, actually quite an impressive debut from Tony Pollard, despite my expectations, he went 16 carries for 82 yards and a touchdown, uh, to DeAndre Swift's 10 carries for 30 yards. Very inefficient, not the best start of this Bears career for DeAndre Swift. And then receiving the ball, we had Calvin Ridley catching three passes for 50 yards in his first game with the Titans, and DJ Moore leading the Bears wide receiver room with five catches for 36 yards. Um, total offense is in favor to the Titans by almost a whole 100 yards, 244 to 148 of the Bears, 148 yards of total offense is atrocious. Uh, let me say, I, I think it was like a record for least amount of offense, and you win a game, so huge, huge props to the defense and special teams of the Bears to somehow pull off that victory. Titans led the turnover battle 3-1. Uh, Titans had more time of 
decision, 34 to 53, in terms of uh, passing the ball. Oh, sorry, in terms of sacks, let's talk about sacks first. Uh, Titans allowed three sacks, Bears allowed two. Uh, Titans rushed the ball by about 64 or more yards, 140 to 84. Passing the ball, you know, Will Levis had more success than Caleb Williams. Uh, both teams pretty bad on third down. Their Titans went 3 of 14, and Bears went 2 of 13. And then, as far as penalties, both teams are racking up quite a few. Titans, 8 penalties for 50 yards. Bears, 7 penalties for 55. Uh, and yeah, when it comes down to it, costly, costly turnovers. The Titans easily should and could have won this game, but they straight up handed the Bears two touchdowns. The Bears offense did nothing. The, the Bears offense was historically bad, and he lost this game. He found the Titans. Gotta get the ball under control. Like, this was totally your game. You got completely shut out in the second half. Um, just got very sloppy. The Bears, on the other hand, you, you miraculously won this game, but you really should not have. There's no reality where you played well offensively, uh, defensively. Uh, they bailed you out, so it's gonna take time for, you know, Caleb Williams and all of those starters to get on the same page. Obviously, that was something that most people knew, but I don't think anyone was expecting this rude of an awakening. This was exceptionally poor. And so, uh, once again, like the Falcons offense, this has nowhere to go but up. I can't imagine anything being worse than this. And he still managed to win. So, uh, but based on this performance, I don't know how many wins either of these teams are going to get in the next couple weeks. And we move into the next game between the Texans and the Colts. Very close matchup here between two divisional teams. Uh, teams like... Starting off the game, we had a 3-0 lead from the Texans. Then, a huge touchdown play from Anthony Richardson. Unlaunched a... Where is it? Where is it? 60-yard touchdown pass to Alec Pierce to take the lead. Then, another field goal from the Texans. So, Texans losing 6-7. And a touchdown from the Texans to take the lead 12 to 7. This was uh, anyway, after that a punt by the both teams. And then an interception from Anthony Richardson, but didn't really do too much because the Texans ran out of time before the half and walked away with no additional points. So heading into halftime, Houston Texans lead 12 to 7. Starting off the next half, we have the Texans getting a field goal, taking a 15-7 lead, then a punt from the Colts, and then a blocked punt from the Texans. So it's a very short field for the Colts to play with, and they capitalize on that with a touchdown, bringing the game to 15-13 after a failed um, failed to point attempt, then then the rest of the game is lights out, like it's a straight action from that point forward. Uh, every drive after that is touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. We have the Texans scoring a touchdown, taking it 22 to 13, then the Colts making it 22 to 20, then Texans going 29 to 20, then the Colts going 29 to 27, and finally uh, there was just too little time left in the game. Eight plays, 25 yards. Uh, with two minutes and 14 seconds left, the Texans are able to run out the clock and get the victory here. Credit to the Colts for coming out with Anthony Richardson and making this very competitive on the Texans. Um, slow start to the game, but extremely fast-paced finish by both teams. They really figured it out and made it competitive until the end. CJ Stroud in this game goes 24 of 32 for three, sorry, 234 yards and two touchdowns. Pretty good. Uh, Anthony Richardson, on the other hand, highs and lows for him. Uh, he goes 9 of 19 for 212 yards, 
two touchdowns and one interception. In their rushing game, Joe Mixon, monster game for him in his debut with the Texans, getting 30 carries for 159 yards and a touchdown. Uh, and then leading rusher for the Colts, Anthony Richardson as well, six carries for 56 yards and a touchdown. And then in the receiving game, Nico Collins comes out of that wide receiver, three-headed monster, six catches for 117 yards, and Alec Pierce, the leading yardage guy for the Colts, with three catches for 125 yards and a touchdown. I think what we learned from this, uh, as far as Anthony Richardson, is a uh, man can throw deep. He has great deep ball accuracy. He can give you big plays, big, big plays, and he can run with the ball extremely well. His intermediate passing is not as polished. 9 of 19 is not very good. Uh, a lot of the yards that he did get on the day came from two very big throws, so he needs to work on himself as a passer, but the talent is very much there in terms of total offense between the two teams. We have Houston leading 417 to 303, so over 100 yards extra offense. The Colts also did turn the ball over once uh, to the zero of the Texans. Time of position completely dominated by the Texans in this one, with 40 minutes to 20 minutes exactly. Um, in terms of passing, it was pretty close once you negate the uh, sack yardage. The Texans allowed four sacks for 30 yards lost. The Colts only allowed two sacks. Rushing the ball is really where the Texans had a big advantage over the Colts with 213 rush yards. Oh wow. To the 104 of the Colts. A red zone. The Texans were perfect going 3 of 3. The Colts went 2 of 3. And then penalties. Pretty good job by both teams. The Texans go 5 penalties for 30 yards. Colts go 4 penalties for 20 yards. And then one turnover by the Colts. All in all, I would be very optimistic if I'm the Colts. Uh, clear indicators of what you can do to be better in this game. Uh, one is the turnover. You limit that in terms of red zone. You missed out on one opportunity and yeah, the the Texans were milking this clock. They were running the ball everywhere. Um, even then, with everything considered, Texans going perfect from the red zone. No turnovers. All of that. The Colts only lost by two points. And so, yeah, uh, Anthony Richardson below 50% in his completion percentage. He throws an interception. You guys lose the turnover battle. He still only lost by two. I think that is great. That is a great indicator of how good you can be in the future. Uh, I think your defense does need to step it up a bit, but close offense could be something quite good. Uh, on the other hand, the Texans, they they can run the ball. They can really, really run the ball. And all three of those guys are... I mean, the Texans offense just looks really nice. You know what Dank Dell is. You have Nico Collins getting all of the action in the passing game for yardage. And then Stephon Diggs in his debut also found the end zone twice. So, really good stuff offensively by the Texans. And they managed to barely cling on in this one, but uh, still leading for most of the game. And yeah, if I'm a Texans fan, I'm also happy. So, either way, for either team, I think that this was a great game. And they will both look to build upon it. Uh, very promising starts to the season for both teams. Then we've got the Jacksonville Jaguars versus the Miami Dolphins. In this one, slow, slow, slow start by the Miami Dolphins. Uh, game starts off with three punts, and then it Jaguars finally get a touchdown. Then we get two more punts, followed by Miami turning the ball over on fourth down, uh, leading to a touchdown by the Jaguars. So they lead 14 to 0 in the first half, uh, second quarter, I believe. Then Miami finally able to score their first touchdown of the game with a little over a minute left in the first half, making it 14 to 7. But the Jaguars score another field goal, making it 17 7, heading into halftime. Then we start the second half with four straight punts. The Jaguars then mess up. They have 
two games for sure. Both teams definitely need to clean up their act in terms of penalties. Uh, the Dolphins, they gotta figure out their run game. I don't know what the heck happened, but they could not run the ball at all uh, in this one, considering everyone that they have. Eventually, things got going with Tua and Tyreek, so that worked out. But yeah, running the ball, it did not look like the same Miami offense as last year. Extremely slow start. The Jaguars kind of just choke this one. Um, yeah, a fumble and not being a very clutch turnover on downs. Don't go for it that deep in your own territory. Like, what is that? <laughs> Doug Peterson brought up. Like, that is a silly decision that it, it didn't. It could have bit you in the butt way harder than it did. Um, but yeah, that did, don't do that. <laughs> and then for the Dolphins, missed kick could have brought you to 23. Um, yeah. I guess the Dolphins get away. Luckily, 400 yards of offense isn't too bad. You limited your opponent to just 17. Um, yeah, Dolphins more so concerned about the penalties. Offense, it'll translate eventually. I'm not too worried about it. The Jaguars, you are gonna lose some sleep over this one because you definitely could have gotten it. And yeah, um, gonna need to pass the ball a bit better if you're gonna want to win games. Then we've got a game between the Carolina Panthers and the New Orleans Saints. I was pretty, pretty far off on my prediction for this one. Uh, the Saints. They won this game, and I did predict that, but the margin, I thought it was going to be a close game, and it, it sure wasn't. Uh, right out of the gates, we've got touchdown by the Saints, 7 nothing, and then interception on the first play of the game for the Panthers. Uh, not a good start for the sophomore year campaign for Bryce Young. Uh, that leads to another field goal by the Saints. Then we got a punt by the Panthers. And then a, another touchdown by the Saints. So now they lead 17 to 0. We get another punt by the Panthers and then a field goal by the Saints. So now they lead 20 to 0. Then a fumble by the Panthers offense two plays into their next drive. Another field goal by the Saints. So it's 23 to 0. Three and out by the Panthers. Then one play, touchdown. Um why is it only 16 yards? Something's gotta be wrong. Okay, they punted. How did they score this? Understanding why. Okay, hold on. Two minute warning. Bryce Young incomplete pass. Then Bryce Young scrambles to the left, pushed out of bounds. Then it's third down. Sacked for minus nine yards. Then. Oh, because Rashid Shaheed returned it for 47 yards. So it was just a giant return. Okay, that makes more sense. Uh, that leads to another touchdown by the Saints. Now they lead 30 nothing, and then the Panthers get their first points, so they're down 30-3 to at halftime. Start of the second uh, half, we see another interception by the Panthers, then a touchdown by the Saints, then finally a touchdown by the Panthers, and another field goal by the Saints, and then another touchdown by the Saints. So now they lead 47-10. We see the Panthers turn it over on downs, then the, the Saints, uh, they go 3 now and punt it. We see another turnover on downs by the Panthers, and then the, it's just 3 and outs for the rest of the game. And yeah, so clearly Panthers offense, not good at all. I thought that they had done quite a bit to try and make their team better, but this is right there with the Falcons and the Titans for worst offensive performances on the day. We have Bryce Young going 13 of 30 for 161 and two interceptions. Horrible. Uh, and then Derek Carr on the other hand, only 
four incompletions, 19 of 23 for 200 yards and three touchdowns. He played great. You got Miles Sanders going five carries for 22 yards. Kamara having a productive day with 15 carries for 83 yards and a touchdown. Thielen leading the receiving group for the Panthers, three catches for 49 yards. Two rookie trades, three catches for 73 yards and a touchdown. Offensively, uh, you know, New Orleans was in control easily. 379 offensive yards to 193 for Carolina. Uh, Carolina lost a turnover battle 3-1. to one. Time of possession was in favor to the Saints 36-39 to 23-21. We have the Panthers still allowing four sacks to their quarterback and to the one of the Saints uh, rushing the ball. It was really dominated by the Saints. You have 58 rushing yards by the Carolina Panthers offense to 180 by the Saints. So that's the biggest difference in this game other than the turnovers. Now, uh, I know that Jonathan Brooks is on IR for the first four weeks, but that is bad, bro. Uh, <laughs> no way to even sugarcoat it. Uh, in terms of red zone, Saints went a perfect 4 of 4. Panthers went 1 of 2. You've got 10 penalties for 95 yards on the Saints, so they could have been so much better in this game, even with putting up 47 points. That is all things that they could have done better. And they turned the ball over, so the Saints, what the heck? I don't know if you're, this is the best game you're going to play all season, most likely. And even so, you do have room for a little bit of improvement, but great confidence boost for the Saints. Uh, highest scoring output of any team in week one. The Panthers, this was lousy, this was pathetic. Uh, you have a lot of work to continue doing. O-line still has problems. Bryce Young still has problems. It, it looks like you picked up right where you left off last year, and Deontay Johnson did not help this offense whatsoever. Uh, well, what did he finish with? Deontay Johnson finished with two catches for 19 yards. That is not ideal. Targeted six times. Xavier Leggett actually targeted the most on that offense. Seven times. Um, my, oh my, was that bad. <laughs> Anywho, let's transition to another blowout. Here we've got the Minnesota Vikings versus the New York Giants. Um, this is a game that I said that I think the Giants will win. Uh, we'll quickly look at how that fell apart immediately. Starting possession of the game, three and out by the Giants. Then we have a fumble by the Vikings. And the, the Giants cannot capitalize on this at all. They get a field goal. Um, then the, the, the Vikings get the ball, drive the ball down the field, get a touchdown, leading 7-3 to three at this point. Uh, we get from the Giants, and then another touchdown by the Vikings, making it 14-3, then a string of three punts, and that takes us into the half, so Vikings lead 14-3, but it's still anyone's game at this point, Vikings receive the opening half kickoff, they go down the field, score another touchdown, 21-3, then a field goal by the Giants to make it 21-6, and then a punt by the Vikings, and here is where you ideally want to try and do something if you're the Giants. Uh, instead, Daniel Jones on the first play of the drive throws a pick six. And so now it's 28-6 to six in favor of the Vikings. And then the rest of the game is just punts and interceptions. We have uh, another... We have a punt by the Giants after that on a three and out. Then we have an interception by Sam Donald. Then we have an interception by uh, Daniel Jones. And then a punt. And then turnover on down by the Giants. And then punt. And then punt. Uh, so, Giants, horrible. I severely overestimated how good they could be. The Vikings, I am so sorry. I, I did not expect Sam Donald to be that good. Like, he started out this game immaculate. I think he went 17 of 18 on his first couple passes. Uh, for like 180 yards, two touchdowns. Bro was playing lights out. Um, they are a lot better offensively than I was thinking. Um, so Sam Darnold finishes 19 of 24 for 208, two touchdowns and an interception. Uh, to Daniel Jones is 22 of 42, 186 yards and two interceptions. Rushing yards, Aaron Jones. Uh, he is efficient as always. 14 carries for 94 yards and a touchdown. 
single day rate, the exact opposite, 10 carries for 37 yards. Receiving, we have Justin Jefferson getting 4 catches for 59 yards and a touchdown. Malik Neighbors in his debut gets 5 catches for 66 yards, which is honestly pretty solid, all things considered. Uh, total offense wasn't even that much in favor of the Vikings. 312 to 240 uh, uh, was the margin, so Vikings led by 72 yards. Both teams turned the ball over twice, and the Giants led to time of possession. 32 to 27. <laughs> what the heck? Um, how, how is that possible, bro? Um, the Giants allowed five sacks in this game. They went 7 of 8 on third down, uh, turned it over on downs twice. They were 0 of 3 on the red zone trips. Vikings were 2 of 2. Um, Vikings rushed the ball for 111 yards. Giants only 74. Truly, it is like amazing. I mean, the Giants did give them points directly and they didn't capitalize on the other turnovers. So, it's really just the offense, like the offense moved the ball a little bit, but they did not score points, and that is, I'm gonna keep it real, if the Giants could not beat this Vikings team, I don't know what the Giants can beat, this is so, so bad, six points, I honestly don't know how you're going to win any game like that, like, jeez, you gotta play the Titans, the Falcons, or the Panthers at this rate, and maybe you'll get a win. <laughs> what the heck? Uh, the Vikings, on the other hand, man, oh man, should I have been um, more confident in your abilities? I, I went with the underdog in this one, thinking the Giants at home could do something. I should have known. I should have known what uniforms they were wearing. Obviously, they were going to lose wearing those atrocious pieces of clothing. Uh, probably the worst uniform I've ever laid my eyes on. It is bad. And, yeah, they played like they were wearing a terrible uniform, so remove it, don't ever wear it again, just pretend that this game did not exist, this was trash. Um, in the Vikings, you, you really exceeded my expectations, and Sam Darnold played quite well, uh, so yeah, just try and keep that momentum going, I, I have no other word of advice. Now we finally move into the afternoon slate. We've got the Vegas Raiders playing the Los Angeles Chargers in this game. We've got um, opening a couple of punts by both teams. They had a turnover on down by the Raiders. A uh, crazy idea. It looks like it was fourth and one at the Las Vegas 40 and they could not convert. I'm not really a fan of being in your own territory going for it on fourth down in these games, like at the beginning. <laughs> I, I don't get it. Then, field goal by the Chargers. Then a touchdown by the Raiders. They managed to put together a solid drive, take the lead 7 to 3 over the Chargers. Then, punt, 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 punt. Finally, we switch it up with a Raiders fumble, which leads to a field goal by the Chargers. So at this point, we go into halftime with the Raiders leading 7-6. to six. Not a lot of good football being played here, folks. Then we get in the opening half, uh, opening period of the second half, we have a punt, a three and out by the Raiders, another field goal by the Chargers. They take the lead 9-7, to seven. then a fumble by the Raiders, which should give them a very good field position, but the Chargers somehow managed to punt. <laughs> Anywho, anyways, then we get the Raiders missing a field goal after a decent number of uh, plays to put together a good drive. They get 49 yards and then they miss the field goal. It was a 49-yard attempt, I guess, acceptable distance to miss from. Then we finally get our first touchdown by the Chargers, and this is from Joe, sorry, Justin Herbert to what? Never mind. That was 
the first play. It's J.K. Dobbins. J.K. Dobbins runs it in for a touchdown, uh, giving them a 16-10 lead. Uh, sorry, a 16-7 lead. Then there's a field goal by the Raiders, making it 16-10. Then bunt, bunt, and then we get another touchdown by the Chargers. Uh, and this was a very good drive. Eight plays, 92 yards, three and a half minutes. This is where we saw the Lab McConkie touchdown. And then the Raiders uh, trying to put something together. And they throw another interception. So, yeah, with that, the Chargers run out the time. They win 20 to 10. Not a good game to be watching, I'm sure. We have Gardner Minshew going 25 of 33 for 257 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. Uh, which is a pretty Gardner Minshew-esque stat line. This is exactly what I'm expecting out of him. Then we've got... Bro, is that a cartoon? Sorry, I'm looking at the icon for Gardner Minshew and I can't tell if it's an eye. Well, no, that's, that's not a cartoon. That's just what his face looks like. Ah, uh, sorry. I mean, after that, Justin Herbert, 17 of 26 for 144 yards and a touchdown. I don't know if I've ever seen Justin Herbert throw for that little amount of yards in a game before. Barring injury, uh, rushing the ball is Samir White, 13 carries for 44 yards. Not very good at all. J.K. Dobbins, on the other hand, a very, very good game. Uh, 10 carries for 135 yards and a touchdown. Then, receiving, we have Jacoby Myers with three catches for 61 yards, and Ladd McConkey with five catches for 39 yards and a touchdown. Um, offensively, both teams were pretty bad. We've got 296 total yards for the Raiders, and then 316 for the Chargers. But the Raiders surrendering three turnovers was pretty detrimental to their efforts, uh, even though they led down with position 31-44, 228-16. We've got, um, passing was more or less the same. No, actually, it was not more or less the same. The Raiders threw for way more yards than the Chargers, which makes no sense. Uh, but the Chargers allowed one sack, and the Raiders allowed four sacks. Both teams pretty horrible on third down. We've got the Raiders going 5 of 14, the Chargers actually worse at 4 of 15. Um... But here is the biggest difference. We've got the Chargers rushing for 176 yards and the Raiders rushing for 71. Uh, in terms of red zone efficiency, Chargers were able to go 2 of 4, which is solid. Raiders went 0 of 1. And then penalties. Raiders did a great job, surprisingly. 2 of 15 on penalties, but 7 of 50 for the Chargers. And then 3 turnovers by the Raiders offense two fumbles lost, and one interception thrown. So, really, for the Raiders, protect your quarterback. Don't let him get sacked four times. Don't turn the ball over three times. You won't lose this game. The Chargers, your offense needs to be a lot better. Uh, rushing the ball, I know that you are running a run-first mentality, and 176 is a nice number. But personally, I don't think it is acceptable for... Justin Herbert to finish with 144 passing yards like that. The routes are not routing you. In no world should Justin Herbert finish with under 220 yards in a game, in my opinion. Obviously you won, but you struggled pretty heavily against a Raiders team that is not that great. Um, and yeah, the Raiders, yeah, just, just control the ball a little better. you can tell this is taking too long. I am going to do this pretty in-depth this week going forward. Well, actually, there's not going to be a recap video the next two weeks. I'll get into this at the end of the video. Never mind. Let's go into that Broncos game. Oh, uh, we had... Let's start. Let's start here. In this Broncos game, we start the game off with an interception by the Seattle Seahawks offense, leading to a field goal by the Broncos, so they lead 3-0. Then we've got multiple punt 
shots by both teams. Finally, a field goal by the Seahawks, making it 3-3. Then we get an interception by the Broncos, leading to a Seattle safety. <laughs> and so the Broncos lead 5-3. Then get a Broncos field goal and a touchdown by the Seahawks, making it 8-9 in favor of Seattle. And a punt and another safety. What the heck? How do you allow two safeties in the same game? I've never seen that. Uh, so Denver leads 10 to 9. Then we have a field goal by the Broncos, giving them a 13 to 9 start, heading into halftime. Uh, this spells disaster for the Seahawks. How do you have two safeties and an interception in your opening drive? Not good at all for this new coaching staff. But they're able to turn it around in the second half. We see a 3 out by the Broncos offense, followed by a touchdown by the Seahawks, making it a 16-13 lead for the Seahawks. Then the Broncos go out and they fumble the ball, leading to a Seahawks field goal, making it a 19-13 lead. Then another 3 and out by the Broncos, following a uh, touchdown by the Seahawks. So now it's 26-13 game is fully in your control now. You went from having a pretty bad day to, like, you're gonna win this game, most likely. Both teams, um, punt the ball, and then we get an interception by the Broncos while they're trying to, like, catch up. The Seahawks really can't do anything with it. They go three and out, and then Broncos get the ball back in their hurry-up offense. Uh, Bonix does a great job of scrambling with the ball, and he's able to rush in for a touchdown making the game 20 to 26 and then um Seahawks just run the timeout and win the game so rough start for Seattle but they end up taking it home and they have a very good second half I was able to catch a decent chunk of it uh in this game you know quickie struggles for Bonex he goes 26 of 42 for 138 yards he's not throwing the ball very far at all uh, how can you have 26 passes completed for 138 yards, bro? That is, that is five yards pass. Then we've got two interceptions for Geno Smith, on the other hand. Not a phenomenal day. Uh, passing the ball, 18 of 25, 171, one touchdown, one interception. Not the best day for him either. Uh, Bonix was the leading rusher for this team as well. Five carries for 35 yards and one touchdown. And his scrambling ability did show up. Uh, towards the end of the game, and it was, it looked good. Uh, Kenneth Walker, leading rusher for the Seahawks, 20 carries for 103 yards and a touchdown, and then receiving the ball, Josh Reynolds, uh, rookie, not rookie, new wide receiver addition for this Broncos wide receiver room from the Lions. He finishes with five catches for 45 yards, and Tyler Lockett has six catches for 77 yards. Um, Broncos offense gets 231 yards of offense to the Seattle's 304. Uh, Broncos offense turns it over three times. Seahawks only turn up to over twice. We've got almost even time of possession. Third downs. Both teams are pretty bad. We got the Broncos going 5 of 18. Seahawks going 4 of 12. And passing the ball. Both teams are pretty bad. Both allow two sacks to their quarterbacks. Seahawks have a rushing edge by about 47 yards, 146 to 99. Uh, red zone, Seahawks go 0 of 1, and the Broncos go 1 of 4. Uh, that is very concerning <laughs> to the Seahawks. And then penalties, Broncos have 8 penalties for 60 yards. Seahawks have 6 for 41. So yeah, if you're the Broncos, honestly, consider this a success. You had all your rookie struggles. You only lost by six points. You turned the ball over three times, uh, but you still forced a couple of turnovers. You forced a couple of safeties. Defense, at least through the first half, was doing a great job of bothering the Seahawks. They never even really got into the uh, red zone more than once. So defense did a solid job offensively. Uh, you're going to have to work on the passing game with the Bone Knicks. Uh, obviously, it's all new and fresh, but the connections are not there yet. Um, but if you limit the turnovers and you can just pass the ball a little better, it should be... Like, this isn't that bad. Uh, we've seen a lot worse from some of the other teams. Bone Knicks did have a rough debut. 
with that last drive that I saw was kind of promising and so um, yeah I, I mean it could be way worse you could be uh, like the Panthers losing my 37 points and said you lose by 6 so you played bad but you still almost won it it's it's a decent place to be in then Cowboys at Browns Uh, we got, let me just tell you the final score, um, the Cowboys take this one 33-17, they dominate in all three phases of the game, we've got Dak Prescott going 19 of 32 for 179 and a touchdown, Watson going 24 of 45 for 169 and one touchdown, two interceptions, uh, Zeke gets 10 carries for 40 yards and a touchdown. Jerome Ford gets 12 carries for 44 yards and a touchdown. CeeDee Lamb gets 5 catches for 61 yards. David Njoku gets 4 catches for 44 yards. We've got Dallas getting 265 yards of offense to the 230 of the Browns. Browns turn the ball over twice though, and the time of possession is even. Biggest factors in this game We've got the Browns going 2 of 15 on 3rd down plays and 3 of 5 on 4th downs. Um, the Browns allowed 6 sacks. Oh, they did have their starting tackles out, but 6 sacks is crazy. Uh, that led also to 2 interceptions thrown by Deshaun Watson. Rushing the ball, it was almost dead even, 102 to 93. Not a big difference there. Cowboys went one of one in the red zone attempts. The Browns went two of two. Penalties, both teams, egregious amount of penalties. Eleven penalties by both teams. Uh, for Dallas, 85 yards for the Browns, 64 yards. And the Cowboys got a special teams touchdown. And I know that the Cowboys were dominating for most of this game, but you have, uh, you know, Dak not really having an amazing day, and so many penalties. You could have played better, and I think that's pretty promising. I feel like winning by 16 points, putting up 33 points, and you did not play your best football, that is actually quite good for the Cowboys. Um, only 265 yards of offense. And then for the Browns, goodness gracious, uh, you're going to need that O-line beefed up. Hopefully get those linemen back, and then maybe that will help with the, the turnovers. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say. Uh, 24 for 45 is not that great either. I mean, they were down for a lot of the game. He had to throw it, he had to air it out. But Amari Cooper was not involved in this game, and I think that's a problem. So I would fix that if I were at the Browns and the defense. The defense did not hold up. Anyway, after that, let's talk about the Commanders and the Buccaneers. We've got Jaden Daniels making a start against this Bucs team. Um, Commanders end up losing this game 20-37. to uh, Let's just go through everything. Jaden Daniels, 17 of 24, 184 yards. What the heck? Sorry. Um... Then Baker Mayfield, 24 of 30, 289 yards, 4 touchdowns, fantastic day by him. Got Jaden Daniels, 16 carries for 88 yards, 12, sorry, 2 touchdowns rushing. Then we got 9 carries for 62 yards by Bucky Irving. Uh, receiving the ball, we got Austin Eckler leading the Commanders, 4 catches for 52 yards. Chris Godwin getting 8 catches for 83 yards, 1 touchdown. I'm so tired, bro. <laughs> yeah, uh, Washington gets 299 yards of offense to the 392 of Tampa Bay. Neither team turns the ball over. Uh, the difference was third down efficiency. Buccaneers had no problems, went 9 of 13, whereas the Commanders went 2 of 8 on third down. Uh, we had, you know, some passing struggles, inaccuracies from Jaden Daniels. He is not able to do all that much in the passing game. Only 184 yards to the 289 of Baker. Uh, we see two sacks to Jane Daniels, one to Baker Mayfield. Rushing the ball, the Commanders actually did have the edge. Um, and the Commanders went 3 of 3 on the red zone drifts, and the Buccaneers only went 3 of 5. But they had some bigger plays. Uh, both teams had 7 penalties for around 50 yards. So, what do you do? If you were the commander, 
Eagles because based on everything they didn't play that bad of a game honestly just time it's just gonna take time you had more rushing yards you didn't turn the ball over it's just getting out those rookie struggles uh, and he didn't play that bad Jim Ninos ran the ball really well he just didn't pass it that amazing um, so yeah work on that just work on the passing get Terry McLaurin more touches get the other bases on the offense more involved Buccaneers on the other hand they played phenomenally uh, four touchdowns is great Chris Godwin Mike Evans they both did really well Bucky Irving had a nice game uh, yeah Buccaneers showing up strong at home in game one uh, just try and keep that going and then finally last game of the day got the Rams and the Lions I'll do a little more, more of a play by play on this one because I did watch this whole game um, we had the opening period pretty empty no scores until the Rams finally kick a field goal taking a 3-0 lead then we got the Lions going for a field goal making it 3-3 then they before halftime get a touchdown making it 10-3 uh, this was also right around the time that the, the Rams were going to score a touchdown and they threw a pick in the end zone and that really ruined their momentum uh, heading into half and so coming out of the half we have a giant touchdown pass from Jared Goff to Jamison Williams big catch and run giving the Lions a 17-3 lead but then their offense kind of like disappears completely Rams take over they score a touchdown Kyron Williams make it 10 to 17 then Rams score a field goal uh, they couldn't get the touchdown but they get the field goal and now it is 13 to 17 then it is uh, they actually take the lead off a Cooper Cup a touchdown pass and so now it's 20 to 17 in Detroit with limited time left they march down the field and kick a field goal to tie up the game 20 to 20 in the overtime period at the Lions win the coin toss. They charge down the field and David Montgomery punches it in to give them the victory. Uh, yeah. Here we had Matthew Stafford going 34 of 49, 317, one touchdown, one interception. That interception was really costly. Honestly, make or break the game right there. They totally could have won this game if that pick had not happened. Um, rushing the ball. We had Kyron Williams getting 18 touts for 50 yards and a touchdown. Very inefficient compared to what he did last year. And Cooper Cup, huge game because Puka Nikua went out uh, early in the game. So Cooper Cup, fully healthy, looks like his old self. 14 catches for 110 yards and one touchdown. For the Lions, we had Jared Goff going 18 of 28 for 217, one touchdown, one interception. Not the best game. Uh, the interception was an unfortunate time and yeah they just weren't really connecting Amon Ra did not have a good game barely targeted uh, David Montgomery led in carries uh, 17 carries for 91 yards and a touchdown and the game sailing one and then Jameson Williams 5 catches for 121 yards and a touchdown big day for him partially why we didn't see as big of a day from Amon Ra they did a good job of eliminating him Rams and Lions both very close on the offensive side of the ball. 387 yards of offense by the Rams to 363 by the Lions. Both teams turned the ball over once. LA led time of possession 3 34 minutes and 56 seconds to 2945 of the Lions. Uh, even though Lions were the only ones to touch the ball in the overtime period in terms of third down. Both teams very similar. We got 5 of 12 from the Rams, 6 of 13 by the Lions. The Rams did turn the ball over on fourth down rather early in the game, and that also hurt them. They went one of two on fourth down, whereas the Lions went one of one. Uh, if they take points there, also probably win the game. Then we've got uh, passing yards clearly in favor of the Rams over the Lions, but rushing yards of the Lions get 163 to the 83 of the Rams. So those factors kind of balance out both teams allowed two sacks uh, both teams had two successful red zone drives but the Rams had five trips total to the red zone and I think 
think that also factored into the laws more so. Uh, going to a 5 is worse than to a 4. And so, yeah, the Rams had a lot of things where they could have won this game, and they just didn't. They don't look back and think, like, easy things that they could have fixed. Uh, I have no idea what's wrong with my hair. I think it's just knotted at the end. Hang on. Uh, both teams had six penalties. Turned the ball over. Lions, it was concerning. I mean, you stepped up in the clutch, tied the game, and then able to win it in overtime. Really, defensively, they looked pretty good, except for the Darian Arnold holding penalties. If you clean up the penalties on the defensive side of the ball, they had a lot of, like, costly spot foul type penalties. That is the biggest thing. Um, and then offensively, like, get Armand Ra more involved. Uh, the running game was fine, but you really turned away from him, and I would not do that. I would get Laporta and Armand Ra more involved. I know that Jamison Williams had a great game, but Armand Ra being that quiet is it puts you in bad situations like this. The Rams, on the other hand, Booker, hopefully it's okay. Uh, but Cooper Cup looked great. Stafford, if you don't have that red zone interception and you don't have that missed fourth down, very easily could have won this game. They battled hard to get back into it, and I would be pretty impressed with how they battled. Um, really, if they had a chance to touch in overtime, they would have won the game also. So. Don't be too upset if you're a Rams fan. You played very well, and for the Lions, you walked away with the victory, but uh, ideally you do want your offense to be a little bit better in the passing game. And yeah, with that, we are done. We are absolutely done. Man, oh man, uh, let's talk about the next couple weeks. I travel the next two weeks before I actually settle into the school until as far as like content goes. We're looking to do three videos a week. It's going to be a recap of all the action until Sunday night on a given week. Then Tuesday night is going to be a fantasy football recap of like the best performing players plus waiver wire additions. And then probably like Thursday night or Friday night, my predictions for the upcoming week. So three videos a week on Sunday night or Monday morning, whatever works out better. Uh, I guess Sunday night or Monday night. I don't know when that video will come out necessarily. It might be tough to record, edit, post all in the same span. Or it'll just be a very condensed video. This is like, it's going to be like two hours long. It's more in depth. You see me clearly getting tired. Uh, I can't go this in depth. I really don't have time. So the next two weeks, this video will not even exist, but once I come back into school, this will be probably less than 30 minutes. I'm, I might only just do score recaps and the best performing players. <laughs> I don't know, I have to figure out how to trim this. Um, and then, yeah, those other two, I will find a way in the next two weeks. Those will still exist, the fantasy football one and the waiver, sorry, and the predictions video the next two weeks, they will still be around, even though I'm traveling, and then once you see me, I'll let you know when I'm actually settled, you'll be able to tell, uh, but yeah, it might be a little bit hectic in the upcoming weeks, this is my last week of work, this is right before I go back to school, so, lots of change, lots of other responsibilities, but it was a fun first week of football, oh, and by the way, just with the way that the schedules work out, I will not be able to include Monday on any of these, like, recap videos. It will always have to be made Sunday night after the Sunday night game. Um, so yeah, I apologize for that. But scheduling is kind of important. I do want to space out the videos to give you time in between to watch them. So that's why I was thinking Sunday night, this recap video. Tuesday night, I do want to get out the fitness table ball ones because waiver wires open up Wednesday morning, so that does matter. And then Thursday or Friday, I'm either one works for the prediction video. I don't think it really matters too much. Uh, but yeah, that's what I'm aiming for. We'll see what is achievable, what happens. But thank you all for sticking with me and watching this. If you enjoy content like this, feel free to like, comment, or subscribe. I'll be putting out more videos in the upcoming weeks, as I've just explained. And yeah, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.